I think that when it comes to the low hanging fruit of general population goals of cardio respiratory adaptations and skeletal muscle mass, there's a million ways that I can get there actually. What I'm trying to get at is what's the most appropriate way for you with the least cost of doing business. That is the differentiating factor. Otherwise, it's all of the same arguments. Free weights are better. Machines are better. Bands are better. And, and you don't like, think that that's even where the conversation should be. It's a conversation that is not all that fruitful. All of those things can work. But like, do I want to take the scenic route? <laughs> do I want to just get there? Yeah. A special thank you to Apollo Neuro for sponsoring this podcast. You know, I was out for a walk uh, with my husband and I decided to put the Apollo wearable, which is the device that I've been using to help manage my stress and energy because it sends these vibratory pulses. I decided to not wear it on my ankle last week and wear it on my wrist. And I was holding my husband's hand and he was like, um, why is your arm vibrating? But little did he know I had the Apollo wearable. Why would I wear this? Well, number one, I am really trying to reduce my caffeine intake and the Apollo wearable really kind of gives you this boost of energy without any stimulants. It was developed by neuroscientists and physicians, delivers a what I consider a soothing vibration. You can check on your phone and you can um, program it. So I use social and open. You can use rebuild and repair. There's tons of different programs. Again, you can wear it on your wrist, ankle, you can clip it to your clothing. For my listeners, go to apolloneuro.com slash Dr. Lion for $40 off. That's apolloneuro.com slash Dr. Lion and you'll get $40 off. One other reason I love the Apollo Neuro is I use it before bed. There are real studies that show 19% more time in deep sleep if you wear before bed. This is a great, great device. I highly recommend. Go to apolloneuro.com slash Dr. Lyon and get $40 off. Pat Davidson, it's so great to sit down with you. We've been in contact for a little bit now, and I was really excited to find out that you're uh, local to New York. Yeah, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be able to be here. I know, um, you know, our, our common connection is Don Saladino. Yeah, he's the best. And, you know, I, I've, I, I'm always impressed with Don. You know, know. he's just somebody that has a, a life force to him that is different than what most people bring to the table. You know, yeah. it's like as soon as you meet certain people, they're like the Higgs boson of humans. <laughs> and I feel like that with you as well. Like there's a certain like energetic drive to you that's yeah. similar to what Don brings. And so anytime he's enthusiastic about me meeting someone or talking with someone, it's kind of like, I'm going to pay attention to that. Yeah. So it's, um, and you saved my ass with, <laughs> um, you know, at the time where, where we were being introduced, I had like a, a serious issue with having like a professional team hack my Instagram account. And that sounds like, you know, whatever, but that's my business. Yeah. And so it was like, it was almost like someone had stolen my business and, uh, and I was like kind of in a, a, a crisis state there. And you were like, actually, you know, my, my team has assembled kind of like a, a working plan for what to do if, if this happens. Yeah. Excuse me. <clears throat> and, um, and I was able to utilize that and very quickly recapture a, a stolen business. Thank and so God. it was like. Wow, this was like a very <laughs> impactful, meaningful introduction here. Yeah. So it's it's really nice to be able to meet you in person today and be able to sit down and, and have a good conversation, hopefully. Yeah. It well, um, if you have anything to do with it, it's gonna be great. Um, you know, it's interesting. I'm sitting here with you and you are much calmer in person and just very kind of zen, which is an interesting characteristic. Mm. Typically those in, you know, and you're also very intense and somewhat aggressive, yeah. but in terms of the information that you put out, which I absolutely love. Uh, we often don't talk a lot about the backstory of people, mm. but I am so interested mm. in a bit about who you are. And yes, we are going to get to the science and you are a PhD in exercise physiology and you do have a undergraduate in history. Yeah. But I'm just curious. Uh, yeah, I, I think that in a lot of ways, my backstory almost doesn't make sense. You know mm. what I mean? It's like it, the 
end product doesn't uh, make sense from in terms of like the parts that lead to it. Uh, because, you know, I, I think that for me, like uh, my parents, you know, I have a father who's never been in my life, who's, you know, I, you know, he's not even, you can't find any information on the person. He's not on my birth certificate, nothing. Uh, but I do know that he was, you know, an alcoholic, drug addict, career criminal, in and out of jail his whole life. Uh, you know, my mother was a very, very bright woman. And I remember seeing a picture of her from when she was young, not recognizing her at all. Like she was a beautiful woman, but, and, and like I said, she was a very bright person. She was a lawyer. She was very talented, college, uh, educated, but you know, a drug addict, alcoholic. Um, I never knew her as anything other than, you know, a negligent drug addict. Wow. So... You know, I, I was uh, raised by a combination of my grandparents until they died and my aunt after that with like a brief stint with my mother in kind of like ages 8 to 11 where it was sort of like living in a, a drug house with her, um, abusive, neglectful, really a bad situation. And, you know, even from there... A better situation for sure, uh, going with my aunt, but, uh, you know, I, I had very bad substance abuse problems as a teenager, mm. early twenties. Um, and I have a very, you know, like all of, if you go through a profile of an addict, like I just check every imaginable box and that has been something that I've had to deal with, uh, throughout my life. You know, I was able to get sober from substance abuse at 23 years old. It's going to be 20 years this December. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. But there's all kinds of other manifestations of how that personality type presents itself later on in life, whether that be inability to really be uh, you know, a good partner in a relationship. Uh, I'm a very reactive person. Mm. You know, I, I, I think that there's where there's historical problems, there's hysterical reactions when you're presented with things that remind you of those old events. So I realize that about myself and I definitely carry like a vindictive streak or I'm highly motivated by resentments. I isolate quite a bit. I, uh, you know, there's all these things that I, I contend with that are sort of like, formulated through uh, a, a wiring system that takes on uh, this this mechanism of not trusting other human beings and trusting things that can become like uh, obsessive projects or uh, obsession with people, places, things, you know. And your profession, probably. Correct. Workaholism is just another outlet. Is that how you found um, exercise? Yeah, I, I uh, you know, f I think that from a very young age, exercise was my outlet. You know, I didn't have to be home. I could be on a team. I could be training. You know, I, I liked sports because, again, like I think that forming relationships with other people has been a real issue for me throughout my life. But the rules of sports are very clear. Hmm. You know, there's an out of bounds line. Um, there's, you know, whether or not you excel is just based on your knowledge, skills, and ability in that area versus life has so many other elements to it that are just like not nearly as objective. So I really gravitated towards training, uh, particularly things that involve measurement because it's just so cut and dry. Right. And if you put effort in, you're going to get return on that in a fairly close to linear fashion, particularly in the beginning. So yeah, I think that there's definitely been an easy relationship for me with training and fitness and probably self-medicating myself along the way as well. Really, when you look at just sort of like neurochemistry and the effects of different kinds of exercise on balancing all that. Yeah. So it was probably either, you know, uh, substance abuse as an attempt to medicate, which didn't work so well, 
exercise or maybe if I had been put on meds or something at a younger age, that might have also done something. But I think if you really look through it, exercise is probably the best approach towards actually helping a brain yeah. become more functional, particularly when that brain is not set up for society. Yeah. It is really interesting that you've been able to overcome all this stuff. And I, and I think that the listener can really relate because a lot of the exceptional people that go on to do exceptional things are not necessarily raised or bred. It's not this perfect situation. And in mm -hmm. fact, one would argue that perhaps it's the perfect situation that uh, allows complacency. And I'm not saying that everyone should grow up in a very difficult household. But, you know, I will see, especially with the military operators that I have the privilege to work with, they end up going on and become phenomenal warfighters, not because their home life was beautiful, but typically in spite of that. Right. And, you know, you mentioned something that I think is really profound, and we're going to really get into your work, is that you found in exercise and, of course, then going on to do a PhD, really looking at data and really being able to get you know, an input and um, an output that makes sense as opposed to emotion, which is mm -hmm. uh, highly variable and oftentimes erratic, right? And you've actually developed systems. So you, know, you, you said that your background is unusual and, and maybe how does it fit into today? Mm -hmm. But I would say it fits in perfectly. And that's, you know, I obviously didn't know this part um, of your history. But what I've been so impressed with that you've done is when we take a step back and we look at nutrition and we look at medicine or we look, we look at the things, how do we optimize the human? That input would be, well, you need medicine to take care of them. Nutrition is kind of all over the place, mm -hmm. uh, probably because you have to eat and um, it's something accessible. And then training is really all over the place mm -hmm. when it comes to movement. And, you know, these are things that we should already know how to do. But there is so much noise and inconsistency in the space that for a non-fitness professional, it's really confusing. Yeah. I, uh, my background is more academic, you know, and I was a professor before I came to New York uh, to work in the personal training industry. And when I got here, I was just so perplexed by what I was observing. You know, I was able to exist in a bubble and I was educating uh, the students that were going to go on and become the next strength and conditioning coaches for professional teams, Olympic centers, uh, private sector places that work with like, you know, guys that are going into the NFL combine or special operators, you know, those, those were the students that I was helping develop. And when you're in that, you, you, everything's systematic and, you know, seemingly logical and it looked like it's still kind of a, a disaster when you actually see the way that things work, even at the highest level, you know, I always talk about the analog of the Wizard of Oz, where you're <laughs> sure that there's like this golden brick road that leads to this amazing place where everything is like held, you know, on a pedestal by a wizard. And then you kind of pull back the curtain. And you're like, oh, come on. This is the, this is the thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that was still way, way more sensible and organized than personal training in Manhattan and group fitness in Manhattan. It was right. like, oh my God, like this is a disaster. And what impressed me, I think impressed is the right word, maybe not. What maybe surprised me the most, what I, I still struggle with conceptually, is that Manhattan uh, people are some of the smartest, richest, most discerning people you'll find on the planet. And they cannot distinguish between different levels of fitness providers. And they actually like, so there is a zero understanding on the consumer side, what a good product is, you know, fitness is still dominated by gadgets and sort of like uh, hyperbolic personalities on the provider side. It's kind of like, oh, I trust this person. And why? Because maybe they're attractive, charismatic, energetic. Uh, you know, s very good at sales. Like those things to me are like, hey, that's predicting whether or not this fitness provider is probably going to be successful. Mm 
mm-hmm. and get a lot of people to follow them, not competency or knowledge, skills, and ability about, you know, human anatomy, physiology, or training science. So Absolutely. It's, it's like, and for me, you know, I, I think that my background sets me up very well for this, quite honestly, because when you grow up in, in family settings that set you up for addictive stuff, you basically learn how to navigate minefields and you problem solve. And I think that my brain is one that has overcompensated towards analysis because of the- Kept you safe. Yes. Kept you safe. Very yeah. much so. So I will, if presented with a puzzle that I find interesting, pick at that puzzle, pick at that puzzle, pick at that puzzle until I really figure out some way to consistently identify the pieces of the puzzle, understand the arrangement of the puzzle, pull it apart, put it back together, and then try to beat the system. Mm. You know, that's, that's what I've consistently done my entire life is try to beat systems with a better system. And to me, there's, that's sort of what I want to do professionally is establish a systematic approach that will ultimately pull the inadequacies of fitness prov- provision and just apart, like, and, and reassemble it in a way that I think is better for everyone. And I want to do this because of the actual significance of the impact of fitness on people's lives. You know, it's yeah. literally going, it's, it's, it's the most underappreciated element of existence, I think, at this point in time. Couldn't agree more. Uh, you're speaking my language, right? Yeah. At least from a medical provider standpoint, muscle is this organ of longevity. You know? You're more likely, like the greatest predictor of all cause mortality is VO2 max. And then like close on that list is going to be obesity. Close on that list is going to be skeletal muscle mass. Uh, you know, muscular power output is going to be up there. But it's it's like, it's way more effective as a something to administer than any medicine. Totally agree. You know, so how do we actually uh, create a situation where people are given appropriate doses of the world's greatest medicine? How do we do it? I think that- And you've come up with certain- My own thoughts yes. on it that I hope at least begin a thought process going in that direction that's helpful. I certainly don't think that my way is any way the only way or anything like that. It's just hopefully leads to better questions and conversations. Uh, that is critical. It's interesting. There's got to be some convergence of all these different modalities. You know, and again, I've been thinking a lot about this because in medicine, there's certain algorithms and mm-hmm. there's a lot uh, there's so much less input and even in nutrition designing a proper nutritional plan, there's so much less input by the way. So this is the amount of calories, um, calories in, calories out. You know, we can all argue about that, but the reality is it makes a difference. And when it comes to movement as medicine, you could tell me, okay, you're going to go do three days of heavy lower body exercises and here, you know, and that output is going to be totally variable for me versus you versus Don or or Mm -hmm. anybody else. And what I'm hoping that you can do during our time together is help make sense of how do we teach people what do um, professionals and even non-professionals need to do and think about and where can they start and what are the things that they should all be doing? Sure. I, you know, I, I sort of, uh, there's a few things that I think are, are really big hitters and it's funny. I, I, I teach seminars And recently when I start out these seminars, is there a free ticket for me? Maybe. (laughs) Absolutely. I would, I would, I would love to have it here. Yeah. I'm going to be doing one in January in, in, uh, Wyckoff, New Jersey. So that's close. I'm there. I'm there. That'll be a a good one. Sorry to interrupt you with my, no, not at all. Um, but I, I, I say, listen, like I hear the feedback that I get or what people, you know, maybe post on social media as their big takeaways or whatever. And to me, they, the big takeaways that people have are the wrong takeaways. So I'm going to, you know, I, I want to give you the punchline before the joke okay. in some ways. Yeah, I want the punchline. Of yeah. like, um, you know, when I'm presenting information, the thing that I want people to take away more than anything is removal of arbitrary decision-making. To me, 
anytime that I hear something that indicates an arbitrary decision, I'm like, whoa, this is a big problem. Give me an example. Um, okay, I I like this exercise for you. You know, like, whoa, you like this exercise for me? That doesn't make sense. That would be like a doctor prescribing me a, a specific drug because they're like, yeah, you know, I just like this one. Without rationale. Right. Like, no, no, no. Shouldn't it fit into a specific category of pharmacology? And, you know, there should be an appropriate dose, appropriate directionality of the way that that dose will change over time based on responses. Like now this, I'm like, okay, that's a reasonable, logical decision that's based on evidence and, you know, history, precedent, uh, and, and seems to be one that's modifiable based on as close to objective decision-making as we can get. Not uh, like I'm trying to shift away from subjective arbitrary towards more, you know, objective logical. You know, the more that you can move towards decision making that is based on objective logical as opposed to subjective arbitrary. And would that be that, based on an endpoint goal, for example? Do absolutely. And, and can this translate to the general population? Absolutely. Okay. Every I mean, so the the other one that I try to make very apparent to fitness providers is that, you know, I think being a history major is helpful for this. Most industries are on a timeline of development. All industries are on a timeline of development. And I would say that the fitness industry is in the Gilded Age. And we are in 2022 going on 2023 very soon. Other industries have gone through a industrial age, a post-industrial age, a technological modern age is kind of where most things sit. And meanwhile, the fitness industry is operating in the Gilded Age. And what I mean by that is the only way that you can currently be a good professional is that you needed to apprentice with a master craftsman. And that master craftsman will bestow upon you their knowledge and their eye and their decision-making and their practice. And so it's kind of like, it's very hard to find someone who is now a master craftsman that you can work with because they, you know, like, how did they get to where they are? And so I would like to see some movement towards every provider, not depending upon a Gilded Age development process I see. to actually become an outstanding provider. I see. And that's why you've taken your knowledge and taken um, critical thinking and mm -hmm. put it, distilled it down. A am I hearing you correctly? As much as possible. Yeah. You know, like, and, and it's funny, I think that the doctors and surgeons that I've talked to, surgery is still a bit of a Gilded Age profession as well. Like you uh, actually it is absolutely have absolutely a you mm -hmm. are absolutely correct. It is a Gilded Age profession, yeah. without a doubt. So how do you establish, you know, a better protocol so that there's more? I I am a like I I've said this before. I don't know if I believe in God, but if there is God in my mind, the closest proximity to it is progress. Hmm directionality towards something better. And, you know, I would just like to see that we as an industry can get to the point where like there's, there's a movement towards, um, and, and where I, where I'm going with that is in order for there to be progress in anything, the first step that you need is standardization. Once you have standardization of, of some level of the working variables, now you can begin to toggle maybe a variable at a time, two at most, and you can actually see what occurs in response to that. You know, it, it's empiricism, it's a scientific, materialistic, philosophical thought process, but it's the most powerful tool that the human mind has ever come up with, is scientific materialism and utilizing that empirical, guided, decision-making process to be able to, at the very least, eliminate the things that we know don't work, to leave the things that are possibly worthwhile to examine and actually functional left, you know? Yeah. that's It's, it's just very profound. Yeah. Um, Science won't tell you what works, but it'll knock the pins <laughs> down to the things that don't work. Absolutely. Paleo Valley graciously sponsored this podcast, and I'd like to take a moment and highlight one of my favorite products that they make, the Paleo Valley Beef Sticks. You've heard me talk about them before. One of my absolute 
favorite snacks. Listen, if you are really particular about texture, this is your beef stick. They are 100% grass-fed, grass-finished, all organic. They use beef sourced from small domestic farms in the U.S., which is really important. And they use real organic spices. But most importantly, these sticks are fermented and it creates a natural occurring probiotic, potentially even prebiotic. And we know that that's critical for gut health. They taste amazing. They are great for on the go, especially if you're going out, going to a party, don't want to be stuck starving, snacking on popcorn and nuts. Take your beef stick. It might seem weird, but do it. You can get 15% off if you go to paleovalley.com, put in the code Dr. Lion. That's paleovalley.com, put in the code Dr. Lion. I guarantee you this beef stick will quickly become one of your favorites. And who knows? It could be a stocking stuffer. Anyway, I absolutely love this product. I won't highlight anything that I don't love. And this certainly is one of those things. Go to paleovalley.com, put in the code Dr. Lion for 15% off. When I think about um, you know, medicine, they do a really good job at standardizing things. Mm -hmm. And even in nutrition, while everyone's arguing about certain things, it's still pretty good at standardizing most, you know, things. Yep. Why do you feel that fitness is kind of behind or do you feel that fitness is in that uh, in an alignment with, say, where medicine is or where nutrition is? It's such a novel field. Mm -hmm. You know, it, like the fitness industry is more novel than nutrition, more novel yeah, than yeah. medicine. It's still, it's yeah. still pooping in its diapers. <laughs> no, I mean, when you think yeah. about it, even when we think about World War II, when they were coming up with rations and figuring out what we should eat, what we shouldn't, the there was no, at least in my knowledge, there there was no. Okay, well, you should train this way. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? I mean, I don't even know where the birth of. I'm old enough to remember <laughs> training that, came from. you know, no one exercised in the 80s. You know, like you're much more likely to smoke cigarettes than you were to exercise. If you were exercising in the 80s, you were either a bodybuilder or a jogger, you know? And I think that was the only information available to you then, too. You know, it's like if you're going to lift weights, you're a bodybuilder. If you're going to do exercise, I think most people thinking of exercise would have been jogging. So now more people exercise in, in some way, shape or form than ever before. Lifting weights has become more normalized. You know, uh, your grandparents might lift weights. Your kids might lift weights. My kids most definitely lift weights. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, it's not this fringe, super subculture group only that's participating in this anymore. So it's, and, and exercise science is so new, you know what I mean? Like even, like I said, like there's, there's kind of like the origins of, of training with resistance that are weird. Like this still, still like you read a textbook and it starts with like Milo of Greece lifting progressively heavier, the same cow as it's getting older. You're like, this is in the textbook. This is such a obscure, odd thing to start with, but like, okay, it's in every textbook from the perspective of progressive overload. If he just picks up the same cow as it's getting older every day, he'll get a little bit stronger as the cow gets a little heavier. It's like, all right, I guess this is, <laughs> but it's, it's telling, uh, I guess where I'm, where I'm coming from is it's like fitness is still the wild west. You know, it's so new as a field, the thought, like, you know, even in the, the seventies, eighties, the prevailing wisdom from doctors was do not exercise because it's bad for your heart. You know, it's, we know that pathological hearts are enlarged hearts. You're an exercise enlarges the heart. We don't want thickening of the myocardial walls and we don't want an increase in volume of the ventricular chamber because guess what? That is actually the definition of pathology of the heart. You know, it took research to demonstrate, well, actually, uh, you know, asymmetrical lumpy thickening of the myocardial chambers right. or, or of the wall right. is, is right. the problem. Like we get a symmetrical normal thickening with exercise with resistance training and the enlargement of the ventricular chamber is also not like a, a volume backlog flow going back into the pulmonary circulation as you would get from like a congestive heart failure. No, it's just that the actual chamber has increased to be able to increase um, stroke volume 
with and it's you get a better ejection fraction with a larger starting you know end diastolic volume like it's all good across the board but we're only a couple of decades into even knowing that right you know so it's it's so new and to me anytime you have a new industry you the first step is you have to create a taxonomy and it doesn't exist right now correct and basically what you're saying is how can we take fitness who is what is so valuable even more valuable than a medication per se depending mm -hmm. on the individual and standardize it in a way that we can all apply it fitness professionals people just as a concept of understanding right and how, did you have an so i'm assuming that that's your why that's your driving force yeah. to make the world a better place which is no small task i i remember early on saying to myself and other people I want to be able to walk into any commercial gym anywhere in the world and see someone doing a really good squat, full range of motion with appropriate load, and they end their set at an appropriate point. And when it comes to figuring out how to standardize this system, where do you start? When you created this taxonomy, yep. can you explain... Uh, and is that your seven pillars of it, it is uh, system? It, it's yeah. I, so I have my seven pillars system, and I use pillars. Like I, I almost think of it in reality as more like filters or cheesecloth. And um, at the after you filter all possible things through these seven layers, you're left with a very specific end product, a tool, and that is an exercise that makes the most sense for the person that you're working with based upon their goals and their needs. And so how do I get there, so to speak? And and really like the first pillar or filter to me is the taxonomy component of it. Um, maybe the first two. So I, I went back to thinking about, like I always bring up Corollus Linnaeus at this point in time. And by the way, what is taxonomy for the listener? A taxonomy is, well, it's almost easier to s explain it through Corollus Linnaeus. If you go back to like seventh grade biology, he created the system naturae, and that's your whole kingdom, phylum, order, class, genus, species. <laughs> and now I yeah. know that like, it, yeah, it's a lion, but it's also like feline, you know, panthera. I can describe this animal. Through, I know that it's a vertebrate, it's a mammal, it's an animal, it's not a fungus. You know, it's, 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 this is the, 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 uh, the, you know, with medicine, for instance, there's a generic name for every drug, but there's also kind of a pharmacologically categorized name to it as well. Absolutely. And I look at, look, the tagline from the American College of Sports Medicine was exercise is medicine. And many other groups have used that same tagline as well, exercise is medicine. So to me, it was like, well, if we're going to make this statement of exercise is medicine, let's dig a little bit deeper and talk about medicine. You know, how does medicine work? You create a category for everything. You have to actually very specifically say what something is. If it's a drug, you have to talk about, you know, is this a, a barbiturate? Is this, you know, amphetamine? Like what exactly, what category does this substance fit into? And from there, I have slightly different, you know, iterations of those drugs. And from what I understand about pharmacology, the evolution of it over time is you go from dumb drugs towards smarter drugs. And a dumb drug is one that has, it, it doesn't have as, as specific a target cell. So it will interact with many different kinds of cells. And you get the primary outcome that you're looking for, but you also have side effects. And the more side effects, side effects are just simply because like, hey, this drug that was supposed to interact with prostate cells also interacts with neurons and kidney cells and liver cells and on and on and on. And it does what it's supposed to do at the prostate, but it also causes, you know, my liver to have some growth element that's not good or whatever, you know, over time, I would like to have a drug that doesn't interact with the liver that still does everything at the prostate. So I get all of my primary outcomes with far fewer secondary outcomes. And to me, exercise should feature a similar kind of a pathway or evolution to it of, can I begin to identify a type of movement that 
gives me a very specific outcome and is very reliable in giving me that same outcome when dosed in an appropriate manner and titrated from a dosing perspective mm -hmm. to continue to give me the appropriate uh, outcome. And can I limit the side effects? Because nobody's training for joint pain. Nobody's training for inflammation. And oftentimes those things can be side effects and ride along mm. with exercise. But if I can continue to give you the primary outcome and avoid those side effects, I think that I'm making it a more sophisticated approach over time that people are more likely to stick to that is more uniform, all of those things. Right. So in order to be able to start that process, I need to be able to kind of come in with a scalpel and make divisions because there are different directions that the body can move in. There's different shapes the body can assume to be able to make movements happen. A human body, the anatomy, the, the expression of in vivo biology is so beyond complex that it's so daunting to try to make this thought become a, a workable model. And I don't have the hubris to think that I understand biology in vivo. You know, the smartest people since the beginning of time have right. been trying to understand this. Right. You know, Galen, uh, Vesalius, Da Vinci, you know, these are all people whose eyes are so laser-like in their analysis and their obsession is beyond belief. And I certainly wouldn't put myself in a category like that. I'm just another person that's interested in a topic that hopefully has learned and been able to be put on the shoulders of people that came before me. I just want to be able to use whatever it is in here to create a workable system that makes other people's jobs easier. Hmm. Could you take us through, would there be an example of what that kind of dumb drug to smart drug looks like? Maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. just an example of uh, a client or maybe a team or something like that. Sure. Well, everything depends on the goal, you know? And I think that, uh, so for instance, people, like what are the most common goals that people come to the gym with? I would say by far and away is to look better. You know, like even I assume even when people say that they don't want to look better, they still want to look I better. I agree with you. I, and I would yeah. say the general population that's, you know, yes, you have the athletic performance. Mm -hmm. that, that's um, one, you know, one kind of end of the spectrum. Right. But most, I would say nine, no one is going to say, um, I'm going to go to the gym, but I actually don't want to look better. Yeah. But I um, want to go to the gym. Right. Well, I mean, so yes, I would agree with you. And I would think that like people are, you know, an exercise people are be familiar with as like a, a big rock exercise is a squat. And I, th I would assume that the tool that most people think of would be a barbell and the positioning of that tool would be on the back, you know, uh, sitting on top of the shoulders. And to me, I'm like, yeah, it's a, it's a perfectly fine exercise, but it's less targeted in some ways than maybe another tool positioned in another place. You know, to me, a back squat is going to train, you know, the, you know, technically it's going to be the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton in terms of the muscles. So yeah, you're going to train your thighs, your hips, your butt, your quads, all Thank those God muscles, for that. <laughs> no. you know, also that's what's going to ride along with that is going to be all of the anti-gravity supporting musculature of the spine. And, and you might say, well, this is great. You know what I mean? Like this, this is, it's, it's a shotgun of an exercise. Like I'm going to train pretty much everything on the posterior side of my body. I'm also going to be training my quads, all of these things. So is squat the dumb drug or the smart drug? I would say that it's more over on the side of the dumb drug. Okay. Because what's going, like when you think about I am squatting because fill in the blank, most of the time you'd say glutes and quads. Okay. And are those actually going to be the limiting factor? for your performance in that action. Whatever the thing is that's the limiting factor is going to be the thing that will adapt the most from that exercise. And I've seen enough people that are average to below average exercise performers squat. And almost never is it their legs or their butt that's the limiter. It's their, their back or their technical ability to do the exercise or something along mm. those lines. So it's like 
it's it, there's some other choice for them would probably be the thing that would make their quads and their glutes the limiting factor, aka the thing that's going to adapt, aka the thing that's actually going to look different in response to the exercise. For example? So I think that something along even a hack squat, a machine, where it's, you know, you get in it, it's on its path, you push up and you shoot the machine up, you come down. Yep. And it's like, I guarantee you that if you do that particular piece of equipment, it's going to be your quads that are going to be the thing that's your limiter, that's going to be the thing that gets trained. And if that's your goal, then that's probably more in line with your goal. In order for the squat to actually match that, the amount of technical proficiency would have to be very high. The amount of experience you would have to have would be very high. It's, 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 these are always difficult conversations. This is I'm, really, actually, this is incredibly important mm -hmm. because the majority of individuals will go and say, okay, and listen, I tell patients that they should be good at squatting, bench, bench pressing, deadlift, deadlifting. And I, that might not particular, like eventually that they'll get good at that. But what you're saying is actually making me rethink my process and also probably the listener because we're told, okay, we should go to the gym and you should bench or you mm -hmm. should go to the gym, you should squat. And what I'm hearing you say, well, if you're really wanting to build your your glutes and quads that while you, quote, should be able to squat at some point, that's not necessarily the choice that's going to give you the best result. There's, yeah, I, I, like I'm always after actually identifying the emotional connection that people have with certain movements and getting past that emotional connection. And to me, things like barbell squatting, barbell bench pressing, there's a strong emotional connection people have with those things because it takes effort to learn how to do those things right. It takes investment of energy to be able to actually develop yourself with that exercise. There's so much that goes into becoming proficient and talented at that, that you it becomes part of your identity in some way. Mm. And you develop an emotional connection with the movement. And that's a natural thing for human beings. Like human beings have a different wiring of their brain than any other animal on the planet when it comes to movement. The basal ganglia is generally considered to be the movement center of your brain. And for other animals, there's much more of a direct wiring of the basal ganglia to the motor neurons that descend down to the, the, to the skeletal muscle. And with humans, there's been a usurping of that where the motor cortex has bypassed a lot of the traditional basal ganglia wiring in other animals, and it descends directly to the alpha motor neurons that go to the muscles. It's a part of the cortex though, and anything that's cortical is going to be this mishmash of sensory, emotional, cognitive, unconscious, and conscious. There, you, can, you can't have a movement without a thought, without a sense, without an emotional connection to it. Versus an animal. It's automatic. That, it's instinctual. Um, and did we evolve? Did the, do we know where, or, or that's just how we were by design? Uh, well, I mean, everything that's different about humans seems to have started with the movement towards bipedalism. Uh, but what's interesting about it, if I build a scientific maze in a lab and I put a lizard into it, it will have to relearn that same maze every single time like it's the first time. If I put a rat into it, the rat basically has a memory component that gets superimposed onto its brain. So it knows there's like two lefts, a right, go straight, you get to the cheese. You know, it gets faster and faster every time exposed to that. But what's interesting is the rat and the lizard have the same motor qualities. It can, they can both rear, they can scratch, they can sniff, they can run, they can burrow, they can climb. And it's just that a rat has a memory imposed upon that. Every other animal is very similar in the mammal group. Humans will be able to invent new movements that no other animal can do. Is that a positive? Yeah, I would say so. I think it's what allows us to be able to catch a fish in a net from now until the end of time. Oh, that's and interesting. And fish will never figure out the net thing. Got it. You know? I was thinking, you know, do we have a lot of mal maladaptive patterns, a lot of maladaptive movement patterns? Mm. But that's not really what you're saying. You're saying we're moving our bodies and utilizing tools and things that are m 
different yeah, yeah, than, yeah. say, a reptilian brain. Right. Uh, we'll build a hand glider and go over the lab maze wall, you know, <laughs> right. pole vault over mm. it. We'll do movements that no other animal ever came up with before. But what's interesting is because our movement is more uh, cortical, is meaning, that the cortex. Meaning the cortex, meaning it yeah. originates from the cortex. From the cortex. It means that there's also emotional inputs into that movement. You know, you might say to yourself, oh, that's that exercise that I don't like. Or, oh, I really like this one. Or that's the bad exercise. That is that's so interesting. Where exercise. do we even, you know, that we are actually um, kind of qualifying an exercise based yeah. on emotional preference, which what you're saying is maybe valid or not. Could be from something that happened when, yeah. you know, hey, mom's making me do uh, push-ups and you yeah. decide you don't even realize it, but you hate push-ups. Yeah. Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this show. And listen, to live your healthiest, longest, most muscle-centric life, then you need to know what is going on inside your body. I believe so strongly in this. And of course, I am a physician and I do know the importance and the value to you about knowing what your hormone status is, what your inflammatory markers are, your vitamin D levels for that matter. Go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion. And guess what? You can get $200 off Insight Tracker's ultimate plan. So they were offering this for Black Friday and Cyber Monday, but they are extending it to my listeners. And you just have to go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion for $200 off Inside Tracker's ultimate plan or 34% off the entire store. This is incredible. Inside Tracker provides personalized health analysis, clear recommendations, plus an action plan. And again, you can't change what you don't track and you really need to know. So head over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion and see where you're at. I mean, you don't know what your history is emotionally. It's like unpacking that is like... Right just unbelievably complicated. And I would just say like, you know, lions aren't like sitting around after a hunt and being like, oh my goodness, did you see the way that like, you know, Larry like took down that zebra? That was the most unbelievable, you know, tackle I've ever seen. Like that zebra zigged to the left. Everybody thought he was going to zag to the right. Not Larry. Like, man, that guy, <laughs> yeah, yeah, unbelievable. You know, but we'll be like, oh my God, did you see that dunk that John ja Morant did last night. Like I've never seen anything like that. That was unbelievable. You know? And so we, we really create these narratives around movement that no other creature does. And I think that again, yeah, there's pros and cons to that. Like there is the ability to do things that have never been done before. And the expression of the human body is you know, just we can dance, we can invent new things. Speak all for the yourself. Time. Speak for yourself well, I mean, on the not dance me, moves. But like I'll just use the collective <laughs> way as opposed to. Oh, okay. You know. But it's um, it's it's also one where it's like if you're going to have that gift of novelty and creativity, like I think awareness around the the double edged sword of that is yeah. probably also very important, and being able to calibrate or navigate sort of the downsides to that from a professional standpoint is big. And uh, just to kind of translate what you're saying to yeah. make sure that I understand it. For example, you could go do a squat and ultimately you're not leveraging the muscles that you should be. And over a period of time, it ends up in an injury that then takes you out from doing something else. Or is there or, a different you know, way? Um, yeah. it's, it's almost like you know, there's, there's what is appropriate for you right now that's most streamlined towards your goals with the least number of side effects is really it. Like, it's not so much like if you look at the data on people actually just like working out, there's not that many injuries in the short term. But I, I think that what I always am, am trying to think about is, well, what's like the very long term that's hard to research? You know, even like the cigarette uh, research problem back in the day was, is a very telling thing where it's like, you know, uh, for a long time, they, they just could not conclude that cigarettes were bad for you. And now it's like, you look back and you're like, what are you kidding? But like, um, you know, you have to kind of move through animal models and human models and, right. you know, cross time things and big samples. And, uh, it takes a long time for cigarettes to kill you or to create problems. Like it can take, and you a, feel the same way for exercises, potentially, potentially. I just think that, um, you know, I, I try to always 
work around these things. Cause maybe I'm wrong with that thought. Maybe there's something to that thought, but like, I, I just am from like a risk analysis standpoint, like there might be something to that. So how do I, if there is something to that, can I course correct before it's a problem? Hmm. So the taxonomy you know, is where you start. Start with the taxonomy. It's literally, I look at exercise as another form of life. You know, uh, if I look at the total number of life forms on the planet, it's seemingly infinite. How, ma how many things are in your tax taxonomy? Are you adding and updating it all the time? I haven't changed anything to it since I came up with it. And, you know, it's, it's, I have 13 motor patterns. I have three cardinal planes of movement and I have three archetypical stances that you can do those movements from. Hmm. And then there are three loading zones, heavy, light in the middle, three velocity zones, fast, slow in the middle, and three duration zones, long, short, and in the middle. So to me, it's a bit of an alphabet because I can combine those things. And, you know, when I think about exercise, I think about it starting from a letter. You know, a letter would be a single exercise. And I would arrange that letter relative to other letters. And by doing that, I can make a word, you know, and that word could be a workout. And if I arrange those workouts in a logical manner, it would be like arranging words together to make a sentence. And I can continue to build upon that where maybe a sentence is your weekly string of workouts. And if I organize them in a, a direction, that sentence can become a paragraph and the paragraph can become a subheading and the subheading can become a part of a chapter, which can become a book. So I'm looking to tell a story about you, but it starts with an appropriate letter selection that I assemble into an appropriate word that I put into a reasonable sentence that becomes a stream and a directionality and a narrative that you can follow. And to me, that's one of the biggest parts about humans is mm -hmm. we tell stories. We are a storytelling ape <laughs> that has gathered around fires and been motivated by myths since our inception as a creature. And the better the mythos, the more likely you are to believe in it. And if you believe in something, I truly think that you'll put effort into that and that it will grow over time in terms of meaningfulness. And the more meaningful something can become to you, the more meaningful your life can become. And when you have a life of meaning, that meaning might spread to others. So very I well look said. At very well said. Almost everything. Can we start with a pen light? And can that pen light grow to a flashlight? And can that flashlight grow to a headlight? Mm. And can that headlight grow to a spotlight? And can that spotlight become a stadium light, which can grow to sunlight? And you're taking that perspective and putting it through the lens of fitness. Yeah. That is a pretty genius uh, and certainly no small task. What what else does that look like in terms of, so the, the first pillar we talked about was taxonomy and then you had your particular movement, right? That yeah. was that 13 movement patterns. Yeah. Um, was that all the pillars together or? No, it's always, there... you know, it's like there's some, there's some initial work on this. Okay. And like, I, I like, how could someone at home listening, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. man, I really want to hear, I yeah. really want to implement what um, yeah. Dr. Davidson is saying. So I look at, I, I, I say this in my seminars too. If you understand pillars one and two, you can be a really good McDonald's cashier. And, what does that mean? Okay. So if you look Fitness, at a, fast food fitness, if you, yeah, in some ways. Okay. But I feel like McDonald's isn't given enough credit for what it's really good at. Mm. Okay. If you, if you look at a McDonald's cash register, the cashier doesn't need to memorize the price of how much the Big Mac is or how much the number four is or how much a medium drink costs. Wait, wait, wait. So how many times have you been to McDonald's? I mean, I've eaten <laughs> my fair share. You know, By the like, way, for the listener, this guy is jacked, tan, and ripped. <laughs> and you can see that on Instagram. So we don't know how he actually knows what is on the McDonald's cash register, but carry on. There's a button. For that has a picture of the Big Mac on it, which he may or may not be ordering. I mean, the secret sauce is amazing. I mean, who knows what it even is? Uh, but it's it's like the person hit the person orders and the cashier hits the button, and the information for the Big Mac is sent and received by the people that work in the back. 
And let's say they order the number three, which maybe is the Big Mac special, you know? So there's going to be fries and a drink that ride along with this thing. The cashier just hits number three. They don't need to know that this item costs four nineteen or something like that. Boom, one button. And what takes place is the person in the back knows what the order is. They're going to put the patty on the fryer. They're going to put the patty in between some buns, lettuce, tomato, pickles, onions, special sauce. They're going to scoop fries out of the fry later. They're going to wrap the burger, put the fries in a bag with the burger. It's going to slide down that little metal chute. You know this way too well. Person's okay. going to collect it, yeah, yeah, yeah. give it to you. Hey, number 72, your order's up. Number four, uh, take your drink over there to the... So... And you can get that in Singapore, you can get that in LA, you can get that in Des Moines, Iowa, and it's basically going to be the same thing. That cashier doesn't need to understand the supply chain that went into where the meat comes from. They don't under they don't need mm -hmm. to understand the shipping process, the refrigeration. They don't need to understand the assembly of the McDonald's itself and the way that the fryolator is put together and the angle of the metal slide. Right, right. All of those things are accounted for though within this system. And the person that orders receives exactly what they ordered consistently. And I can pay someone minimum wage to make that process happen in live time a million times a day across the world. So it's very low hanging fruit in terms of the provider being able to give the product to the consumer that matches with what the service is supposed to be. Good or bad in terms of food quality, whatever. Right, right, right. That's not the Get point it. here. Got it. So to me, you know, pillars one and two, there's only so many ways that you can exercise, quite honestly. You know, there's, you can push things, you can pull things, you can squat things, you can deadlift those things. You can squat on one leg, you can squat on two. You can squat moving sideways, you can squat moving up and down. You know, there's, so it's kind of like, what are the, the main categories of these things that exist? That's what I tried to do with pillars one and two. Hmm. And so, you know, it, that's, that's kind of what those pillars, that's what pillar one does, is it actually describes the shape that the person assumes for a particular kind of exercise and the direction that they move through space from that shape with, you know? So are you going, are you turning? Are you going up and down? Are you shifting side to side? Are you doing those kinds of movements with a squat, with a press, with a deadlift? What, what's the thing? But it's, it's like, we can arrive at, at those iterations. Um, and do um, fitness professionals, are they trained on exercise selection? No, not particularly. You know, it's it's like the the standard by which people can can become exercise professionals is mind blowingly. You know, do you think that's where all the confusion begins to come in? Yeah, I think so. Because like you can not even attend an educational experience, but pay for a certification online. You know, literally just like, do you have like two hundred bucks, and can you click a couple of buttons? You're certified. Got it. And so so yeah. it's, it's kind of nuts, but you know, I, I just look at it like, Hey, if, if I own a gym, you know, I, I would at the very least want like a good McDonald's as opposed to, <laughs> right. I don't even know what the corollary would be. Right. You know, it would be bad food, mm -hmm. but also not served appropriately. And I don't even know what the person's getting. So at the very least, I would want to be McDonald's. Got it. And that I want my employees to be able to work the register. So you don't say, you know, and I know that I'm going back to kind of specific exercises. Mm -hmm. That's probably um, not, I mean, do you think that there's certain, I think I know your answer is going to be specific exercise everybody should be doing or? Well, I think it's very no. goal dependent. So I, I have different demographic groups that I think are helpful. I, I have general population clients and I just, I would say that the primary goal of that group is going to be either aesthetics or health. And honestly, health is the same thing as aesthetics. I agree. Okay. Because aesthetics is more muscle, less fat, some semblance of cardiovascular shape. 
health is more muscle, less fat, some semblance of cardiovascular <laughs> shape. Um, yes, well said. Yeah. So to me, the way that you get more muscle, less fat, some semblance of cardiovascular shape is actually kind of old school bodybuilding. Okay. Like, and the ways in which bodybuilders have trained has been incredibly variable to tell you the truth. There's some that subscribe to like, we're going to use machines mostly. There's others that are like, oh, it's got to be barbell training. You can probably, you know, I, I look at, I look at it this way. Uh, changing muscle mass is actually one of the easier things in fitness. One of the hardest things in fitness is taking fast people and making them run a little bit faster in a sprint. <laughs> right. No, totally making so good athletes even better is probably much more challenging. Yep. Yeah. And so I look at top end speed as being very genetically locked in. There, you know, if you're really fast, you're really fast. If you're not, there's very little I can do to make you really fast. And um, versus other things, like there's a big window of change potentially. Uh, muscle mass has a bigger window of change. Uh, aerobic fitness has a big window of change. Things that have a very small window of change, like, s like how fast you can sprint, mm -hmm. there's very few methods that can change that. You, there's only like one or two ways that you can be successful trying to attack that variable. It's very similar to like sports, like, like hitting a golf ball straight, there is almost no room for error. There's like only like kind of maybe one or two real schools of thought of like, this is how you have to swing a club. And most of them converge very closely versus other tasks have a huge window for error. Like bench pressing dumbbells has a huge window for error. You can watch someone do a terrible job and they still move them from point A to point B. And, and like, do you think they'll still, would they still get the same uh, impact or end result that they're looking for as it relates to body composition? For the most part. Yeah. I, I, I'm just kind of getting at this point that like with some outcomes, there's many roads that lead to Rome. Got it. With other outcomes, there's like only one way to get into this like very selective place that's very hard to get into to change. And so... I, I think that when it comes to the low hanging fruit of general population goals of cardio respiratory adaptations and skeletal muscle mass, there's a million ways that I can get there. Actually, what I'm trying to get at is what's the most appropriate way for you with the least cost of doing business. That is the differentiating factor. Mm. So uh, you know, otherwise it's all of the same arguments. Free weights are better. Machines are better you know, bands are better, this kind of thing. is, And you and don't like, think that that's even where the conversation should be. It's a, it's a, it's a conversation that is not all that fruitful. All of those things can work, but like, do I want to take the scenic route? Do I want to just get there? Yeah. You know, do I, do I want to pedal? Do I, it's like, Hey, we have cars. You don't need to ride this horse to get there. So would there be some, would you say that there would be some streamlined way that an individual yeah. could get from point A to point B, and let's say it's three days a week with a appropriately designed program, or is this just super dependent on? It's a individual. combination of doing things correct and making the appropriate decision on what you're doing. And I provide in one of the 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 pillar four is what I use to. And which and which pillar is that? So pillar one is, I call that movement quality. That's the one where it's like, hey, these, like, these are the ways that are available to you to move as choices for exercise. Pillar two is movement quantity. There's heavy, there's light, there's in the middle, there's fast, there's slow, there's in the middle, there's long, there's short, there's in the middle, you know? And the way that you arrange these things, you know, as a, for instance, there's, there's deadlift or hip hinge as right. a category of movement in pillar one. And you can do it from a bilateral stance, which is a category of stance in pillar one. And you can do it in the sagittal plane, which means up and down as opposed to side to side. Right. So if I choose hip hinge, bilateral stance, sagittal plane, that describes the motion. It doesn't tell you what tool. It doesn't say barbell, trap bar, dumbbells. I see. So you focus on what is the movement that needs to happen and then pick an exercise that that individual can do well with that movement. And then it's like, well, what load are you going to use? Mm. Is it heavy? Is it light? Is it in the middle? Is it fast? 
Is it slow? Is it in the middle? A fast hip hinge that's medium weight is a kettlebell swing. A heavy hip hinge that's slow is a one rep max deadlift. You're going to get different outcomes from those mm. things. Um, so it's like, well, what, what, what goal are we hunting for here? And if it's muscle mass, as is commonly the thing, well, I can, I know from the research that I can have an equal muscle mass response in terms of th the way that exercise feeds into that. I can choose a load between 30% of the one rep max up to 85%. And as long as I work hard and, and almost get to the point where I can't do any more reps, I'm providing the drug that gives me the outcome that I'm looking for, muscle mass stimulus. Right. So what's the appropriate loading range for the person I'm working with? Beginner, I'm probably going to stay away from load. Load is a little risky, okay? Probably going to go more towards lower load, you know? So low load, it's probably going to be moderate velocity and it better end at low velocity. Otherwise, it's not going to be the effective tool to give you the thing that you want. Hmm. So, you know, it's kind of like, what's a bad choice for this person if the goal is to grow muscle tissue? Probably something that's in a more challenging stance. You know, I, I call it like a lateral stance. Like, you know, hey, we're, we're, in, we're on one leg, the other leg's kicked out to the side, or you got the other leg up and behind you or something like that. Like a single leg deadlift for a general population client is probably not the best choice for muscle mass. It's too challenging for them from the perspective of their competency level. They're not going to do it right. So I don't care how many or what the program looks like. There's no way that this tool is ever going to provide the end thing for the person's wrong tool for the job. So it's, it's kind of like I developed a guideline to be able to tell you this is a higher probabilistic way of using this pattern to be able to give you the outcome that you're looking for. But what are the actual outcomes? Right. What are the, because that's not talked about. So I think that's maybe one of the most confusing things in this fitness industry. And, and why there's so many bizarre classes. There's surfboard exercise classes. I was there's just, I was wondering bicycling that. Bicycling in the dark. There's, you know, like. <laughs> how many new exercise, right. How does that all. Um... And I got a category for all of it. You know what I mean? Like they fit. Like, so I looked yeah. at it like Corollus Linnaeus must've been like, oh my God, there's so many things that are alive. And like, there's these weird animals. There's like mm -hmm. animals in the Mariana Trench that have headlamps and like, <laughs> right. what is that thing? And right. like. So you, you, once you are able to create more categories for things, like it's just like, oh, it's another one of these things, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so it, it's kind of like what I tried to get was like, these are the goals that people have. General population, they're, they're, they're looking for looking better and being healthier, which is the same thing again. Muscle mass, fat loss, cardio. All, all fantastic goals. Then there's special populations, which... You know, when you teach, it's it's going to be subdivided into like there's geriatrics, children, pregnant women, people with uh, musculoskeletal pain, metabolic problems, including, you know, diabetes and asthma and things like that. But for me, like it, let's just, let's just say special populations is people that are dealing with musculoskeletal pain problems right now. And their goal is to get out of pain. And once they're removed from pain, now they can train. And now they move into being either general population or athlete. A special thank you to one of my favorite sponsors of the show, and that is First Form. Go to firstform.com slash Dr. Lyon. I love this company. I trust this company. I've been working with them since 2018. And uh, if you are really interested in working out and training, yes, we can show up. Yes, we can have discipline. And sometimes that oomph is gone. This is why I love Megawatt. I've been really into Megawatt Natural lately. It has niacin, so it gives you that flush, B6, B12, choline, magnesium, has natural caffeine, which is really important, about 150 milligrams, has a neurofactor, which comes from whole coffee fruit, and uh, a couple other extracts. I love this pre-workout. It is phenomenal. 
take a scoop before. You can take a scoop like 20 minutes before you go work out, which is exactly what I do. You can get in the zone. It has electrolytes. Slam it with some water and you are good to go. Head over to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion for free shipping. That's firstform.com slash Dr. Lion for free shipping. You guys will absolutely love Megawatt. I have been using Megawatt for a long time and it is my absolute go-to for mental focus and fortitude in the gym. Athlete to me is an even more interesting spectrum because the guy that wins the half pipe in the X game in skateboarding is an athlete. The guy that's playing uh, left guard in the NFL is an athlete. But these creatures couldn't look any more different from each other. <laughs> one's a grizzly bear. The other one's the fish with the headlight in the Mariana's Trench. Like, ooh, what do I do? <laughs> like, yeah. So I utilize this concept called ground to distinguish between the two of them. And, uh, you know, there's, there's something that was written recently called the Grand Unifying Theory of Exercise Science as a paper. You know that's a big deal. And it's based on the constraint model of thinking through things. And within this, there's the individual constraints, the environmental constraints, and the task constraints. And by changing the constraints in those areas, you create directionality and outcomes. That's what guides you. This is a newer paper, but it's literally called the Grand Unifying Theory of Exercise Science. If there's one thing I'm going to put some stock into, it's a paper called that that's published in a peer-reviewed major journal within exercise science. So I look at it like, okay, what are the individual constraints? That's you as a person. How modifiable are you from your movement potential? If you're the older you are, the less modifiable you are. Right. So it's almost like I don't even want to, I'm, that's an irrelevant thing in some ways. That's a whole other can of worms discussion. Got it. But the other ones are very modifiable. How can I change the environment around you? And how can I change the task that you're doing? So when it comes to the environment, I look at it like, yeah, I'm watching people exercise, but I'm actually not that interested in the human being. I'm interested in everything that's not the human being surrounding them during the thing that they're doing. So the major variable that I've identified in terms of the environment of typical exercise that's going to happen in the gym is ground contact. Hmm. And I identify ground as anything that's not you, that you can touch and push against, and that's going to also push against you. And as a, for instance, something that would be a tremendous amount of ground would be like a leg press. You've got a seat that your butt's on. Oh, I see. Yeah. You've got a backrest. You've got handles you're holding onto with your hands. You've got a, a sled that you've got your feet on. And there's an Im immense amount of, uh, and, and I also identify ground as being that which is easily deformable to that which is almost impossible to deform. What and do you mean? So a BOSU ball is I very see. easy to deform. Yeah. Uh, water is very easy to deform. Um, you know, versus yeah, like, it. hopefully the backrest on the leg press won't deform on you while you're using it. Yeah, that would not be good. Not, not good. Uh, and in sports, I categorize it as there are high ground interaction athletes and low ground interaction athletes, like high divers, skateboarders, surfers are all low interaction with ground athletes. Interior linemen in football, heavyweight wrestlers, mm. power lifters are all very high ground interaction athletes. They're on the extreme ends, but they are as different from each other as you could get. The, that which distinguishes great low interaction with the ground athletes is their ability to turn and tumble through space. That which distinguishes great high ground interaction athletes is the ability to not turn and tumble in space. Hmm. If you're playing interior line in football, you don't want to get tumbled and you don't want to get turned by the other person. So when it comes to the exercise selections that I make for you, for your goals, it is really about how much ground is involved with the exercise. 
You know, if I'm training skateboarders that want to win gold medals, I'm probably not going to make the majority of their training leg press and, you know, chest machine exercises. They need to do things where they're in free space and they're moving. And I don't want them to become rigid and highly muscular. And that's not going to like Tony Hawk doesn't look that way. Uh, and he's going to get killed if he tries to play in the NFL, but the guy in the NFL is going to get killed if he tries to skateboard down the, the ramp. Right. So right. general population, I'm like, well, honestly, the goals are more in line with high ground athletes, you know? And I have, uh, like, when I think about assembling an exercise, I have these descriptors of that, which is a source of ground, you know? Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's like literally even the way that you stand, if you're in a bilateral stance where your feet are next to each other, that's more ground. If you're moving in the sagittal plane, it's more ground. If you're in contact with more stuff, it's more ground. Mm. Weight is ground, it's literally pushing against you. So, you know, that's kind of how I make that distinguishment of like, what exercise I'm going to choose for you. And I'd say this is the other thing. Like I... I want to see that you exercise and you do things properly and across the board, everyone's going to learn how to do things properly by giving them more ground interaction in the beginning. Your first exercises that I ever pick for you, no matter what your goals are going to be high ground interaction. Like I said, with a hack squat, tremendous amount of ground, there's a back pad, there's shoulder supports, there's a thing for your head. So you know where that is in space. It only moves on the, on the tracks. It's not going to move any other way. So maybe um, machines are really good for individuals who are uh, untrained or I start with all the ground with contact. All of that in the as the first choice. You know, I, I I step outside exercise. I say, well, what would I do if I had to teach a little kid how to shoot a basketball? You know, would I start with a three pointer? Way too hard. Way too hard. I'm going to start with a layup, and then if they can master a layup. I'll move a little bit further out and I can add to it. I can teach them how to dribble and off the dribble they can shoot. I can have them run, catch a pass, shoot off the pass. You know, I can have them shoot with their left hand, their right hand, scoop shot, hook shot, you name it. But if they don't figure out the first thing, there's no a priori to base any future learning on. I want to see that you understand the fundamentals first. And to me, I'm increasing the probability that you're going to understand the fundamental with m this concept of more ground. Mm. And then I will systematically remove ground until you end in the appropriate slot of exercises that feature the right ground interaction for your goals. It's just, I would say that the general population's goals don't coincide with low ground choices. Uh, the more low ground you go, probably the less muscle mass driving that exercise is. What would be another example of a low ground? Like, uh, uh, let's say like a exercise. rear foot elevated, but like rear foot elevated split squat, but the rear foot's going to be in a TRX handle that's kind of floating around in space. And the front foot is going to be on a wobble board. Which, by the way, this is what you see beginning trainers, 100%. or not beginning trainers, but beginning clients clients do. all. I see it at the gym every the day. Time. Instead of actually moving any kind of weight, they're doing stuff on the TRX. Um, exactly what you're saying. So low ground The hardest thing to contact. learn yeah. that is the least matched with the goals but it's complicated, it's maybe picture worthy, and it's- So why do you think that that has happened? Where, where is the disconnect? Well, this is literally a model that I've created. You know what I mean? It's not well known. Did you have an aha moment? I've had a lot of those, <laughs> you know? But was there one kind of defining moment where you just are like, you know, uh, I'm- seeing all this input, I'm seeing what's being done, and then a, like, a light bulb goes off. Um, I mean, I feel like I've had that just in terms of understanding like movement of the organism, but in terms of the organizational process, that's probably been more of like a, you know, 
uh, a pebble at a time rather than like a, a collapsing boulder or something like that. Yeah, but yeah. like at a certain point for me, uh, being able to visualize like the skeleton moving through space and what is associated with like the the articulations and how right. they assemble and dis like there's some of those things which are hard to actually put into words come across as a flashpoint moment where it's like oh my god almost like a like an acid trip sort of a thing right. um and that's harder to explain verbally versus these things are more like I'm trying to build a McDonald's supply chain, you know, and these are more like, I'm going to have to spend hours at my dining room table or something like that, kind of parsing through mm -hmm. these things. And like, I, my brain works like a cross-examining lawyer in a lot of ways. Does this make sense? Will this always make sense? Is there any room for error? Are there argue points that someone can kind of pull this sweater apart from? And a lot of times it's just like, I'll... I'll pull it apart myself to the point where it's now like impossible to pull it apart. So some of those, you know, like that going back to the TRX is that's probably um, what I'm getting the sense as is somewhat irrelevant for yeah. the general population that there are probably better ways to build balance and hypertrophy and strength other than assuming that the TRX kind of contraption is you know, which is where I see everybody start. Mm -hmm. And that perhaps we should rethink that modality while novel, yeah. not necessarily the most effective. Yeah, I mean, I like probably the most complicated part of my model is pillar three, which is movement standardization, where I tried to create a basically checklist of saying whether or not a movement is performed competently or incompetently. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is, it's actually, it's a, it's my favorite part of the model, but it's the wildest part of the model. Okay. And like, oh, I can't wait to hear. Huge can of worms. Well, it's, 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 it's based on comparative evolutionary anatomy of the last common ancestor with chimpanzees, with humans and chimps. And then the divergence from a skeletal standpoint and a movement standpoint between chimps and humans. And, you know, uh, the defining characteristic of human beings is, is bipedal stance and gait. And, and that just means that they walk on upright on, upright two, feet. on, on two feet. Yeah. Chimps are knuckle draggers, but they're glorified. I know a few of those. Yeah. Well, Personally. <laughs> no, just kidding. The you do, though, is where I'm going to get to mm. with this, is that there's a concept called Jacksonian dissolution that was started by uh, John Hewlings Jackson, who's the father of neurobiology. And in the 1850s, he put forward this, this theory of Jacksonian dissolution, which still holds. And what he said was that when an organism, a human, is presented with stress, it will cause the most modern parts of the brain to become inhibited, and there will be a reliance on older parts of the brain to deal with this higher stress environment. So under low stress conditions, we're all operating in our prefrontal cortex, and we are very reasonable and logical and nicey-nice and all that kind of stuff. Add stress to the equation, though. You're going to see people in not able to utilize their their prefrontal cortex and they're going to start using older parts of their brain maybe their amygdala fires up it's what they can rely on the and and what's interesting is jackson was talking about this from a bio, from a neurological standpoint but the same concept actually applies on every organ system and every subsystem of the body as well so for instance, I, and I just call, I just think of it as the movement system for the standpoint of expressions of human movement. And so there's this, it's, it, so you have to know the evolutionary timeline of a system, you know, like a brain, you know, we have this triunal brain where we're going from a reptilian brain to a mammalian brain to a primate brain to a human brain and the development of the prefrontal cortex and the size and all that is sort of the distinguishing characteristic. 
I, I like what Robert Sapolsky says about the prefrontal cortex, that it allows you to do the right thing when the right thing is the harder thing to do. And that to me, that is the expression of humanity that you are really ascending into your true humanity, the more that you can do the right thing when the right thing is the harder thing to do. Um, but that's a divergent in, in the topic here, but still one that I think is but relevant, but very, relevant. Yeah. So from a movement standpoint, we evolved as a species, we became modern pre presentations of humans. But if you add stress, you will go backwards down an evolutionary timeline and begin to resemble more and more of a chimpanzee in the way that you move. So whenever I'm evaluating someone very quickly on how, uh, how much, how, how well can you move overall? How many cool things are you going to be able to do? I always look at it like, do you walk like a chimp if I put the chimp on two feet? And when you walk, watch a chimp walk on two feet, it basically lurches back and forth side to side. It's skeleton just, it's like a drunk person or a penguin, you know, it just, it laterally wobbles. It's unable to contain the head and the trunk in between the feet during forward walking. And I believe that I know why they do that. They've lost control over their center of mass and the center of mass, you know, it's roughly going to be like slightly above uh, L5, S1 in terms of, you know, the midpoint of your body. Right. And when that falls forward, you're going to be encountering more and more stress. You know, that's a stress. You're falling. You're literally falling. When you say stress, do you mean... Um, Load, speed. So uh, not like increasing... psychological stress. Increasing cortisol, some kind of... All that stuff. Would a person become, quote, more stressed? Do you think that the that the brain will follow the body? So you put someone in poor body positioning where they're having issues with their center of mass. Mm -hmm. Do you think that someone would then be experiencing life as perhaps more stress? For sure. Hmm. Um, all of these things, like the load placement that I use to set you up for a squat. If I put the bar on your back, it's going to push your center of mass forward. Hmm. If I put the load in front of you, it's going to shift your center of mass backwards. You're going to be way more comfortable if I goblet squat you as compared to overhead squat you. You have to manage so much more of a stressful situation. The more that I put loading in a place that shoves your center of mass forward, mm. because the more your center of mass is shoved forward, the more you're going to move like a chimpanzee. But you're moving that way because you're managing the stress. You're, you're, you're literally physical just and, you know, this, all forms. The psychological piece is really interesting because as humans, we can have adaptive responses to stress, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I'm not saying I don't mm. want you to be stressed, too. Great point. You know, it's can you be stressed and then return mm. back to most modern presentation after the fact? I, in some ways, want to see, depending upon your goals, particularly, how far backwards down the evolutionary timeline can I shove you, How do you do that? during training? If I look at someone deadlifting a barbell off the ground, they look a hell of a lot like an ape, <laughs> you know, okay. and they should. I see. So you're putting, you're picking exercises that would move that center of mass. In the beginning, I'm going to give you the biggest layup that I possibly can, you know, a hack squat, you literally lay back against a piece of equipment. Your center of mass is falling backwards. It's fantastic. You're locked into this piece that only moves up and down. When I think about a squat, I want it to be vertical. When I think about a hinge, I want it to be horizontal. A squat, you're in the elevator, not the escalator. The, head, the hinge, you're in the escalator, not the elevator. But most people are in both at the same time kind of thing. You know what I mean? It. It's neither one nor the other. You, you, the training becomes redundant. It's nonspecific. It's dumber. You're just getting the same drug twice and thinking mm -hmm. it's a different drug. I want it to be differentiated. So the you know it's pillar three, but it sounds like this is still the pillar that is most complex and probably is it the newest development? Not for me. Okay, but you know, like my my stuff hasn't changed in a long time. It's just whether or not it gets known hmm. in some ways. You know, I'm trying to get my stuff more known.
Well, you know, uh, and we'll help you. The yeah. listener here really, you know, we're very interested in. So the 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 main driver behind this podcast yeah. is really about transparent conversations, mm. about transparent conversations where things go right. Yeah. Um, but more importantly, I think where things go wrong. Yeah. And um, my listeners, I love you guys, are very astute. They're a very astute group that are always challenging the status quo mm. and are very interested in the paradigms that we've been taught and challenging those paradigms. Are those right. paradigms correct? Right. You are talking about ways in which we can rethink movement that are extraordinarily comprehensive. Mm -hmm. And that takes a lot of time and a lot of thought and a lot of education. And you're essentially creating a new way of thinking about movement exercise. You know, I say that word loosely, but thinking about the evolutionary process of the human, their interaction in space, how we should be determining yeah. um, exercises and, you know, limiting that cost of doing business, which, you know, I think is very interesting from a medical standpoint because it doesn't necessarily get easier to train. Mm -hmm. It's not to say yeah. that it can't be done, but the reality is life hits you and there is injury, there is sickness. Um, and being able to kind of plan and move and navigate those times, I think are critical. You know, it's, there's so many things I want to say in response to that. I'll try to unpack it in the, <laughs> the easiest way possible. Like, you know, what, number one, I, you know, I kind of started this off sort of saying like, my main thing is like, I'm trying to remove arbitrary decision-making. And like, there's, there is never a time where a decision that I make regarding exercise is arbitrary. Quite honestly, it's, it has been thought out before. I never am in the moment from my decision-making mm. perspective. And you know, to me, I tried to build something that I describe as a Frankenstein monster. You know, like I took all the parts that can create a hole, I put them together, and then I actually flipped the switch and the creature comes to life. And now it's moving on its own. It's self-perpetuating. I wanted to do that with this model, you know, like it's not me anymore. It's the model working. You know, like whatever question the person has, there is an exact answer that takes you. And then what do I do next? What do I do next? And, but my model, and, it, and again, it's algorithmic thinking. It's non-human in the moment so, thinking. And do you actually have a, a program? Is there an actual program in terms of um, like a data-driven program where they punch something in or they- I haven't they... built that yet. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that I've only been teaching this model since January, you know? So it's, it's cool. kind of like- it, to me, it's still, it's coming it, up on a year, better get going. Yeah, it took me, it took me three and a half years to write the book that goes with this. You know, I've been building this model for, I mean, 20 years, a long time. The reality time. is, is, yeah. is not, it's not know, an overnight thing, but conceptually in order for, um, the master, which I think that you're entering kind of that masterful state, which we're always learning, right? Mm -hmm. We're always students is you do have to go through a period of education that is deep and invasive in your life yeah. and create a foundation where then you're getting um, practice, physical application. And, you know, while you're coming out and talking about this model, it is not three years in the making. It's not two years. I mean, this is decades of work. Absolutely. Yeah. This is decades of work. You know, so my model- Which, by uh, the way, you make it look easy. You know, it's, 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 it, I live it. It's, it is, it's interesting. Like, where does the, where does Frankenstein and the monster separate? Like there, I feel like the model is me, but the model. How is it getting received by the, uh, fitness professional industry type? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. And by the like, way, I'm I, moving around a lot because yeah, I do have a, a tendinopathy. I tore my hamstring. Oh, okay. So you want to talk about bad, uh, exercise choices. This is why I'm moving around all the time. Mm. You know, I don't even pay attention to how much it's, how the reception is, mm. you know, I, I just, I just focus on, cause I can't control that. You know, I really just control, like, have I dotted all my I's and crossed all my T's in terms of the model that I'm building? And do I feel as though I'm articulating the message in a way that, that I feel comfortable with that I think is respectful mm. of like, you know, professionalism, um, and not one that is overblown. 
You know what I mean? Like, like what is, what is like, so I, I always step back, like, what is my model? How is it different from anything else? My system is an algorithm that is for exercise selection and saying whether or not the thing was done properly. That's really what it is. And so from the perspective of like, how far can it go? Like, I, like I said, like it, it's, there's the McDonald's cash register level, which is pillars one and two, like just this is your decision making. You know what I mean? Like you have, these are the tools you have available to you. Right. And then like, you know, for general population, basically, you know, the, the resistance patterns, hinging, mm -hmm. squatting, pushing, pulling, that's it. And then three you know, and four are. Th four is basically like, what is the, uh, easiest way to do these things right? And what is the pathway towards making the exercises more difficult until we arrive at the mm. right level of difficulty for the goals of the person? Mm. Three is more under the hood. You know, like what is the actual nature of the human skeleton? And what is the nature of when movement goes wrong? versus it's more mechanistic, right. but you know, it's, it's one where I'm like, look, like this is a, you know, this is a, this is the one I feel least, you know, confidence in from the perspective of like, like scientific, possibly pulling it apart. It's more in the, like I, the other ones I'm like, there's very little wiggle room here. Right. Like this one's kind of like, I believe, so I'll, I'll, I'll step back from it for a second. You know, one of, one of my favorite books is, uh, Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. And the premise of that book is that the worst thing that ever happened in Western society is Socrates. And it's because Socrates, uh, threw out the notion of quality and only went into reduction, reductionist mm. thinking. And that while it is the origins of empiricism, it also basically like just said that that qualitative thinking is is useless and uh, i love it like in that book it sort of it starts with like hey can you define good it's impossible to define but you know it when you see it sort of a thing so everyone that's ever gotten themselves into trouble as a thinker has been someone that's tried to define good and say this is good and this is bad because like, it's just, it's like that gets pulled apart. Mm -hmm. And in the fitness industry, this has happened before, you know, as a, for instance, um, and, and I'm not saying this to be critical at all of, of Gray Cook. Gray Cook created the functional movement screen. And the intent was to say, this is a good moving human and not so much over here. Right. And I can score it, you know, if you're above a 14 on this test and you don't have more than one asymmetry, you are a good mover. Right. And because you're a good mover, it opens up the playbook of exercises for you versus these people that are not good movers. It's more dangerous for them to exercise. Science came in, analyzed this and was like, nope, this thing does not measure anything associated with like distinguishing a person that's less likely to hurt themselves exercise versus someone that's more likely. It's like not, it only measures itself. Hmm. Anytime science comes along and says, no, this thing only measures itself. It, that's like, you're dead. You're, you're dead in the water. So I am coming into this knowing that great thinkers have come along before, tried to define good. Absolutely. So you just stay away from good. I didn't. I said, I'm going to take a swing. <laughs> I'm going to take my swing here. Dead in the water. Okay. I'm just kidding. And I am basing that which I think is good on that which is more modern human and less backwards evolutionary chimpanzee like mm -hmm. you know except that acknowledging when the heavier something gets and the faster you have to move you're probably going to become more chimp like and that's okay as long as you can come back to baseline and still be a human dr pat davidson there, I have. I actually have so many more questions for you. So, uh, if you're open to it, I'd love to do a part two. Definitely open to it. Very excited to, <laughs> um, to do that as well. You're incredibly articulate. Thank you. And very well thought out. And that is 
extremely, extremely essential, especially as you're moving a new idea into the world. Mm. Um, and where can people find you? Um, easiest place to find me is through Instagram. Uh, the handle is at Dr. Pat Davidson, DR period Pat Davidson. And, you know, it's like a uh, link in bio, link tree. We'll, thing, link, we'll link everything. All that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but yeah, this has been really cool. You know, I, I, I am a very skeptical person. I am a very cautious person. And I think that uh, to me, that's very important with a new message as well where it's, it's like, I'm not looking for this message to be something that is about me. I don't even, I it's want it to admirable. like yep. leave my name. I want it to be about the Frankenstein monster itself as opposed to me. And I, I also hope that because, you know, some of the things that, that I've been talking about, I, I think that are, are, they're big concepts. And I think they're bigger than my ability and my brain to actually create best case working scenario mm. around. It's more that like when I was a professor, the students were calling me the sleeper cell activator. So it was like a lot of younger students that maybe were kind of drifting off and like the ones that maybe wouldn't have made it like I'd, I'd they'd get excited. Yeah. Start that I, well, fire. Well, I love it. And, uh... and that's all I want to do. I want to start more fires because I think that other people are going to be able to take some of these ideas and be like, buddy, like, I appreciate you kind of cracking the door here, but like your methodology, a little bit lackluster. I'm like, I know, I know <laughs> no, you I run with it's it. Great. It's great. Thank you so much for coming on. And we'll link uh, where everyone can find everything. And thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.